Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Potters use a wheel, commonly called a potter's wheel, to form the clay. The tool is used to take a useless piece of clay, a hunk of mud, basically, and make something useful out of it, sometimes even something beautiful. Now, you may have wondered what's under this, and I thought, well, the way it looks, it might be a body under there. Some of you are curious, what in the world could be under there? So, we're just going to uncover this and see what's there. And we're talking, we're talking about tools today. Potter's wheel was a tool. So we're talking about tools today. All kinds of tools for all kinds of purposes. Um, you know, this right here is a pipe wrench, also known as a Stilson wrench. And this thing is to turn a pipe, and, or to turn a pipe fitting, or to unturn it. But tools have multiple purposes. These are also good for home defense. <laughs> you can give somebody a thump with that, and they'll lay down. <laughs> if they're bad, you know, you want... So keep a, you know, keep a pipe wrench right by the door. Uh, these are planes. I used to collect these wooden planes. This one, this one here belonged to my grandfather. I can't pick it up with a handle because sometimes the handle comes loose. But it was my grandfather's. And I honestly don't think he ever used it. Oh, wow. I think he bought it at an auction. I don't know that, but I don't think he ever used it. He was a very talented woodworker and a carpenter, but this would have been very much like a plane that Jesus used. Jesus had four brothers, and all five of them would have learned the trades of building. And so in the Roman times, we do know what some of their tools look like, and I believe this would be very similar to a plane that they would have used in the in the shop uh, when Jesus was doing carpentry. And the fact that there were five of them, and they're named in the Bible, that fact um, kind of contributes to the, to the way that Jesus was able to just start, a, start traveling around in his earthly ministry when he was 33 years old. Because he had four brothers there to carry on dad's trade. And, we don't know what happened to Joseph. They also had, had sisters, and we don't know how many sisters he had. But in Mark 6, 3, it says, Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. He had four brothers. His brother James is author of the book of James in the Bible. And it says, Aren't his sisters here with us? He had multiple sisters. And they took offense at him. The word that is translated carpenter here is a Greek word tektron, which implies a worker in wood and stone. Wood was a rare commodity at that, in that part of the world. Matter of fact, I think they had, had to import uh, a lot of wood, but the houses were built out of stone. So Jesus and his brothers were most likely uh, we would call it building trades people. They, they, they would build, build with stone, but they also made probably tables and benches and things like that out of wood. So I don't know anything about carpentry because there's too much arithmetic. And I hate arithmetic. I, I mean, I hate arithmetic. But I'm a woodworker. I can make things out of wood, and I do use some of these tools but um, Jesus probably, this is a barn auger, but 
Jesus probably used, they probably had a series of drills like this with different sizes of bits for different sizes of holes. That's probably how they drilled their holes. This one is used to drill a hole, then they take a chisel and square out the hole, and that's how they make a, mort a mortise and tenon joint. Most likely, this is the kind of drill that Jesus would have used and his brothers in the carpentry shop. And then, that sort of evolved in, into this, I'm going to lose this thing, into a wooden bit brace like this. And I've seen a real ancient one that takes uh, all, the, all the bits had a wooden part on the back, and the wooden thing fit into a socket here. But uh, when I was, I was collecting these wooden tools, I don't know why, they're just sitting there on a mantle, and some are in a box somewhere. But then that evolved into this type. This, is a, this was a craftsman, but it, this was a Stanley type of a, of a drill. It's called a bit brace. This is the bit, this is the brace. And so that's what it sort of evolved into. And nowadays, oh, this must be, we, have, we don't even plug this in anymore. It's electric, I mean, it's battery. And uh, so there's so, so many different things that, um, we don't know exactly how <coughs> Jesus measured things. This is an old-fashioned carpenter's rule. I really like this. I mean, we have tape measures today. I like this type of rule. And this one here has a little brass thing that comes out. You can do it, a depth measurement with that. And I really like these. Some of these old tools are, they're just a, they're just a pleasure to work with. This is a, probably a 19th century type of rule. It's a folding rule. There's a lot of these different sizes and kinds and when you get into collecting these things then they sit around and collect a lot of dust. This right here this is a pair of planes for tongue and groove. One of them cuts the tongue on the side of a board, the other one cuts the groove and that's how they made tongue and groove joinery on the side of a board. And uh, this one here was a rabbiting plane, it's called a rabbit plane, and it has an outrigger here that, that determines how far into the board the, the uh, rabbit with the groove will be. This is a more modern equivalent. I've used this one a few times, but nowadays, instead of that, we just pick up a router and use the router. <laughs> so, and this is a router. This is a cordless router. <laughs> and I have never been able to get that sharp enough to use it. And I suppose in Jesus' time there were different, different uh, ways to make a groove. I don't know exactly what all kinds of things they had back in those days, but um, we all know what saws do. I have a back saw there. And that was Carol's dad's. And nowadays we use a miter saw or a table saw. And uh, you know, my, table saws are good for more than one thing. They're, uh, they're good for ripping a board, cross cutting a board, and they're really good for amputating your thumb. <laughs> <laughs> and I was complimented in the ER. They said, You have a really nice, clean cut there. And took x rays of my thumb. They said, A lot of times we get jagged cuts. So if you're going to cut your thumb off, use a table saw instead of a hatchet, and you get a nice clean <laughs> cut. They, they did the complimented me on that. So these are forming tools, but in order to do a good work, they have to be sharp and tuned up. A lot of these tools, if you go and find them in a, in a like in an antique store. This one here is a more modern equivalent of my grandfather's. Uh, this is called a number eight. And if you look at it, it has a lot of rust and pitting on it. But they can be brought back into a good user's condition. This one has rust on it. I had so many of these, these planes, these kind of modern planes. <coughs> I had three times as many as I could put in my 
wall mounted tool um, thing. So I gave two thirds of them away to my kids. But they were all in various stages of how I found them. You get them in an auction, they're probably in a barn. What? <laughs> I have a Siri I can just talk to. Anyway. <laughs> So these all have different purposes. The jointer plane you, you use to joint the edge of a board because you're going to joint that to another board. And it makes both of those perfectly flat. <coughs> and uh, this is a plane you use on the top of a panel, that you, like a table or something. This is a, called a jack plane because it does all kinds of things. And then you get down into, these are, block planes. This is a low angle block plane. The low angle is because it is good for shearing off end grain. And I use both of these. And just the other day, I got this one at an antique store. I haven't tuned it up yet. And this little wee one here, tiny little plane, I use that one when I built my um, instruments, my guitars that I built. I haven't built any for a while. And if this is a spoke shave. They use it to make a square piece of wood round that's made spokes. And I got both of these spoke shaves in <coughs> antique stores. And I use one, I keep one adjusted to take a fairly aggressive cut so I can shape that thing quickly. The other one is a much finer cut, and it takes off the little ridges that were left by the first one. And then I go to sandpaper after that. So there's all these, all these had different purposes, and today they're kind of blended down into one tool that does all those things. But they do have to be kept sharp. If you buy a brand new plane, it's not going to do its best work unless you tune it up and sharpen it and flat lap the sole of it. What that means is you take a piece of plate glass or a piece of granite and put wet sandpaper on there and you keep running it, running it across there until that becomes perfectly flat. Then it does its best work. So <clears throat> for a tool to be effective, it has to be first of all clean, free of corruption, uh, dirt, rust, old paint, you can see some of these have never been cleaned up and made free of that corruption. And in antique stores, they're in various stages. Sometimes there's chips on the edges, but somebody ran into a nail with it, and a lot of them are rusty. But they can be cleaned up and tuned up and made useful. So that's one thing. They need to be clean. They need to be finely tuned. Uh, the, the depth adjustment on a plane is critical, and it needs to be, sometimes it goes this way or that, it needs to be finely tuned. It needs to be sharp, razor sharp. A new plane out of the box isn't sharp enough to do really fine work. It's, um, you can make it cut the wood, but it's not going to do the really clean cuts that it's supposed to do. How you can tell if you've got a clean cut, a nice clean sharp, you run it down the blade, and you get a ribbon shaving in one piece that comes out of there. A ribbon. And that's how you know. But some are, are used, you know, as I said, for more than one purpose. Like, you know, like the pipe wrench and the table saw. Well, what, is, what about tools in the Bible? A tool is an instrument used to accomplish a purpose. In the Bible, God uses tools. <clears throat> to help humans achieve his purpose. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So God gives us tools to aid us in accomplishing his purpose. Well, what is his purpose? If you look at this thing right here, And you're welcome to come down and look at this later on. <clears throat> I'll bet nobody in here 
can tell me what the name of this is and what its purpose is. I'll bet. I'll bet. Do you know what it is? Why no, not? you had your hand up. So you're welcome to come and look at that and see if you can tell what it might have been, what its purpose was. Uh, but anyway, so what is God's purpose? What is his purpose? It says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. That was Isaiah 43, 7. So our purpose then, what he made us for, was for his glory. Our purpose is to glorify God. That's one of our purposes, is to glorify God. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. That's another purpose that God has for us to be his witnesses and to bring the gospel to the unsaved. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord in Isaiah 43, 10, and my servant, whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. So that's another purpose we have, is to witness that he is God and that Jesus is Lord. God also has a purpose for us to find him, especially the, those that are in darkness, to find him. That's when you step into the light. Jeremiah 29, this is a very, very familiar scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, a plan is a purpose, right? Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then it continues, it says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So God has a purpose for us to find him and, and to be in fellowship with him. So there are, there are purposes. And of course, as the tools have purposes, we are a tool. So what tools does he give us to accomplish his purposes? What things are there in our lives for us to use? Well, I think one of us is his presence, his being in us and with us and around us and near us. In Matthew 28, 20, it says, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you. He's with us. Sometimes life seems kind of bleak. Sometimes it does. Things happen. But he's there. He's with us. His presence we can depend on. We can count on that. And he's there all the time. He's there when we're sad. <coughs> He's there. He's there when we're happy. He's there when we don't know what to do. He's there when... He... I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> I can't shut her up either. So he's there when we're happy. He's there when we don't know what to do. He's there when we're bewildered. He's there when we have to have surgery. He's there. You know, when your house is flooded and you lose everything you have, he's there. His presence was with you. He's there. He's still there. Sometimes the presence of God is all we can count on when everything else is, is out from under us. Look at the people, you know, in, in, in Ukraine that don't have anything to go home to. But there are Christian believers there. He's still there. His presence in their lives, that's all. The second one I'm thinking of is his word. We're talking about tools that he gives us. 
Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. God word, God's word has the answer for all of life's dilemmas. His word guides us along life's pathways. His word keeps us on the straight and narrow in times of murkiness and strange thoughts that the enemy tries to put in our, in our mind. His word solves the problem and gives us proper direction. So that's a tool. But like any other tool, you have to use it. The word you have to use it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sometimes we don't even know what to think about something we're going through. But consult the word. It's, it, it's, it's a God-given tool. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The third one that I'm thinking about is other believers. There's a tool, it's fellow, that's the fellowship with believers. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I think in the King James, that's all unrighteousness. So fellowship with one another is one of the most precious things we can do. And, and there are four biblical ways to fellowship with one another. If we look at Bible verses, we find the process of fellowshipping with one another. Another. The first one is to celebrate together what Jesus has done for us through the Lord's Supper, also known as communion. That's a way that we celebrate uh, together the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks as a participation in the blood of Christ or a, a celebration of Jesus providing salvation with his blood. And the bread we break is a celebration or in her recognition uh, of our gratitude in the body of Christ. And the second one is contributing materially to the needs of one another. It says here, for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. And another one is communicating about God's work in each other's lives. That's, that's a precious thing when you share what God has done for you. When we give testimony in church, when we stand up and say, I was, I was this and I was that, and God came and he saved me and he took the pain away. There's all awesome things that uh, we can testify about. The sharing of our faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing uh, which is in you in Christ Jesus. And the fourth one is connecting with one another in sharing the whole of our lives on a regular basis, engaging in community. You know, when we get together, we talk to each other, and we glorify God, and we witness to each other, and that builds us all up in our faith. So fellowships um, and then the fourth one I have written down here is the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 8. This is what you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is power to witness. Why do we need power to witness? Why do we need power? Well, power is to overcome the weakness that we have. If one of these tools isn't turning very well anymore, I put a new battery in it. I must have eight of those rechargeable batteries for those things. And when they get to this luggage, you put another one. You put that battery on a charger, you put another one in there, and 
It rejuvenates, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So we need power to overcome a weakness, and power is opposite of weakness, and we have a weakness. We have a tendency to shy away from sharing our faith with unbelievers. We have a tendency to shy away from that. Oh, they'll think I'm weird. They'll think I'm a holy roller. They'll think I'm a religious nut. Well, I'll be all of those. Then I bet if I can win a few to Jesus. Satan doesn't want you to share the gospel. He puts that timidity in you. It's like a barrier he puts. And this Holy Spirit power to witness overcomes that. And you just do it. And then Satan has to go away sad because he loses one. <laughs> we want him to be sad, don't we? Amen. So God gives us tools, but he also uses us as tools in his hands to accomplish his purpose. So as a tool for God, we need to be, number one, clean for God. Just like the planes, they have to be clean. So David said, create, it, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Here's the part that we don't really remember about. Then I will teach trans transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. In other words, then I will share the victories of God. If you create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit, that's still true today. So just as physical tools will work best if they're clean, we as a tool in God's hands need to be clean. If I get an old tool from an antique store, i got to clean it all up. And you can see YouTube videos of people that take really bad, rusted planes, and they restore those things, and it's amazing. And they show a nice uh, cut when they're done. But we can't expect God to use us for his purposes if we are residing in sin. If we stay in a, some pattern of sin. The next one is we need to be finely tuned, just like, just like the hand tools need to be. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, and it continues in 17 so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if these tools work better when they're finely tuned, the tool needs constant adjusting. You can't just adjust at one time. I adjust those user those book planes, books. Every time I use them, I adjust them. It, it, it's constant adjustment. And we're like that. If God knows what he wants to accomplish with us as a tool in his hands. And he knows what, what work he has for us to do. Sometimes we need a spiritual attitude adjustment. <laughs> Sometimes we do. I, didn't, I should have had an amen for that. But <laughs> <laughs> he might have to sharpen us up a little bit. You know, when you sharpen a plain blade, you're actually taking some of the material off of it. When you sharpen a chisel, you're removing some of the material. Ouch! He might have to remove some idea or attitude that you have in order to sharpen you up and use you for the next thing he has to do. But wow, how much more he can accomplish with us when we are sharpened up. Then we need to stay sharp. You know, when you use a spoke shave, I sharpen it, it doesn't stay that way. When it gets dull, it starts gouging the wood. I use those when I make the guitars, the cigar box guitars, to round over the back of the neck. When you look at those, they're perfectly round and smooth, but I don't use a router for those things. Um, some people maybe do, but I really enjoy the spoke shape. I just keep shaping that down until it's nice and round, but I have to resharpen that constantly 
to keep it sharp. It, otherwise, it's going to gouge, and uh, that's not my purpose for the tool. If you want to be effective as a tool in God's hand, you will need to submit to constant <coughs> sharpening. Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, if the axe is dull and its edge is unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Well, God's going to have his purpose accomplished whether we allow him to sharpen us or not. God is still going to accomplish his purpose. He might use someone else. In Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. A source of the sharpening is other believers. Other believers. Then, the fourth one is under power. The tool needs to be operated. If I put this plane down on this piece of wood and say, now, plane that board. <laughs> Go ahead, plane it. Nothing happens. <laughs> the tool needs to be under power. <laughs> it needs to be operated. It needs to be pushed. Some tools need to be pulled. Some need to be guided. That's why there are guides built into some of these tools. Push, pulled, and guided as a tool in God's hand the believer has to be under power. God's power. The power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Acts 1, chapter 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That was a power that they did not have until the Holy Spirit no, it didn't have. You receive it when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And empowered by the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, a fisherman, a coarse Galilean fisherman, by the name of Simon, and then he was known as Peter, went out and preached a sermon. 3,000 people got saved and baptized. Peter didn't have any power on his own to do that. He didn't have any education. He hung around with Jesus for three years. But he needed to be under power as a tool in God's hand. And so do I. And so do you. Amen. If you want God to use you, you need to be under the power of being operated in God's hand. And there's nothing else like that. He was under power. He wasn't an educator. He was a fisherman. A coarse person, a person of the sea. He knew how to, how to fix nets and, and and navigate boats and maybe find some fish. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. But he wasn't an educated. He he wasn't a rabbi. But he made, but he but he preached that sermon. The whole thing is in in Acts chapter two, and he, he used scriptures. It was masterfully done because he was under power. From the Spirit of God. That's what we need to do to be under that power. You can be a tool in God's hand. In fact, He wants you to be a tool in His hand. It's an awesome thing when you just walk up and pray with somebody you don't even know. <laughs> somebody in the store somebody in the hospital that, you know, I've been asked to go, go pray for my uncle, go pray for this one. They don't know, know me. Go pray for my friend. He's in the hospital. He might die. I don't know who they are. I don't, you know, I've had people, I don't even know them. This was before COVID. When you could go in and say, I'm clergy, and he's see so-and-so. They just get out of your way. Back in those days, clergy, oh, they're right this way. Unless there was an infectious person, and then you had to put a glove, a, a gown on and gloves. But it's thrilling to be a tool in God's hand, under God's power, to accomplish God's purpose. Amen? Amen. He wants you to do that. He's ready to empower you. 
It might empower you in a different way, in different circumstances. It's not always the same. It's not always the same. But it's just awesome to be the tool. He gives us tools to use, and he, and he uses us for tools. It's so awesome to just be that tool. When someone calls you and says, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm having this, and I'm having this, and I'm having this, and the hens put land, and the cow dried up, and the roller, and the, and the well ran dry, and I got a leak in the roof, and I don't know what to do next, because they happen to know that you're a Christian believer. There's two things you can do. Pray for them and witness. Under power. And you can try to help. So I'm just trying to encourage you today to use the tools that God gives you and to be a tool that God wants you to be at His hand and under His power. Amen? Amen. Will you stand? Anybody wants to come down and try to guess what that thing is? It's close to the surface. You can do that. Lord, sure, thank you this morning for the opportunity to, to bring this truth to your word. To my precious friends, my fellow believers in this place, I thank you for this gorgeous day that all going to enjoy as they leave here, Lord. And we just thank you for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit that will go with us, that we don't just leave it here, that it will go with us, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity to share, and I pray that this message will be um, buried deep in the heart and spirit of those who need it to hear it and accomplish a purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.